All right. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome once again to Wednesday night uh, Zoom Bible study here at PLWC. And uh, we are continuing our lesson series on I Will Build My Church. And tonight, Sister Patty uh, will be presenting lesson number nine. And so without any further ado, Sister Patty, you have the calm. Thank you, Brother Alex, and God bless everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, on this cold February night. It's warming up, actually. Yeah, it is, <laughs> <But> actually. <laughs> um, we're just warming up for that meeting in the sky. Amen. <laughs> I don't know if anyone remembers that song. Oh, I do. Um, <clears throat> so we're on lesson, or part nine, of I Will Build My Church. And I just thank you, Alex, for the honor to teach and uh, to be a part of this Bible study. Um, I love this group from the Outreach. And we Amen. hope someday we're going to return. <laughs> yes. <laughs> name. We will. Um, yeah, soon we'll all be together again. Yes. Praise God. Um, so part nine, uh, we're going to first quickly uh, go over, you know, a quick review. I'll try to be really quick about it because we're already to lesson nine. So that's a lot of review. But we'll just go over the main points. Um, just to remember that God's, this is, this series is God's blueprint for the church. We studied part, ma part one, which is what the church is not, not a material building, not a denomination, and not plan B, and what the church is, the centerpiece of God's kingdom. And it's the only thing that God had to purchase, and it shall not be shaken. Uh, uh, Sister Patty, uh, I'll have to pause there. I forgot to mention everyone, please, Everyone mute yourselves if you're not already muted so that all we hear is Sister Patty teaching. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oops. Right. I hear a phone going off. I'm not sure where that's from. All right. Thank you, everybody. Go ahead, <laughs> Sister Patty. So what we've seen through all this, this entire series is there are certain principles that um, are brought out about God's church. Principle number one is do and teach, which is Acts 1, that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you receive power, <coughs> principle number two, to witness and to wait on God. Principle number three is to rise above and go beyond. Rise above all our obstacles that are in our lives and go beyond into victory. Part two, principle number four, was apostolic agreement. The three principles of unity. Were, and we know how important unity can be as a small outreach. We've found out it's so imperative that we agree together, that we work together. Principle number five is apostolic altar calls. The three steps of obedience to the gospel repentance, water baptism, and Holy Ghost baptism. We know from the outreach, <clears throat> we've had many moves of God where we've been repenting. We've seen many of us get water baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, and I thank God for that. Part three, principle number six, the power of a testimony. Why is a personal testimony still... <clears throat> Excuse me, the most pervasive, persuasive so what is, what is communication. Is that is that... Sorry. Okay. So, why is a personal testimony still the most persu persuasive means of communication? We know that to give your testimony is the most powerful thing you can do besides praying for somebody. There are four parts to our testimony, and there are suggestions for how to prepare it. And there, are, and there are also, you can make a theme for your testimony. Every person's testimony is important. No one should feel that their testimony, every, no one should feel that their testimony is not, is, they should know rather, that their testimony is unique and extremely important. Can everybody mute, please? I'm hearing a lot of, uh, background noise thank you so much okay thank you um so we don't want you to feel like your testimony is unimportant but is extremely important each one of us has a testimony that is unique and powerful it is impossible to build an apostolic church without your testimony 
That means your testimony, whatever God did in your life, whatever he did to bring you to him, that's your testimony. And that's why God saves you. Part number four, principle number seven, honest motives, according to Acts 5.2. Covetousness, coveting is the uncontrolled desire to acquire. And there are four ways to conquer coveting. Resist comparing ourselves one to another. Rejoice in what we do have. Release what I have to help others. And refocus on what's going to last. And then there's hypocrisy. And we're not going to discuss that. But just to know that was one of the things we discussed in part four. Part five, principle number eight is team minutes. Put that chicken away. I wanted you to see if you look for this point. Okay. Problems with teams, murmurings, too much work for the pastors to do. It's so important that we all pitch in and, and do our part to not put all the work on Pastor Alex and Sister Melissa. Um, yes, they have an integral part and they have a, uh, you know, they, so they're up front, they're doing a lot, but we can all chip in and do our part. And God has set some in the church. God did that. So he put us in the church, not just to share our testimonies and help others come to him, but to help each other as a team ministry. There are gifts of helps and governments. And then you, we discussed in part five, our best gifts. Principle number nine, a living legacy. New methods, change. Why our church must never stop growing. To change a method doesn't mean eliminating the old, but rather incorporating the old within the new. Methods change, but the message of salvation remains the same. Amen. Principle number seven, part seven, principle number 10, connecting with our culture. The, the biblical concept of targeting, it is not wrong to target cultures. It isn't wrong to target people in the sense that we need to know who we're helping, right? We need to know their culture so that we can reach them. The Bible determines our message, but our target determines how we communicate that message. We discussed that, um, and also uh, there was another meeting I was in where we asked the question, have you ever tried to reach out to another culture? And what kind of obstacles or difficulties or challenges did you have? That's something to think about because we are surrounded in New York about with many, many different cultures. And even though a lot of us, we have similar cultures, there are many around us that their cultures are very, are extremely different. And because not everybody here in America has been living in America as long as we have. There's a lot of new uh, immigrants with many different cultures. So it's important to understand what those are. And Jesus, his standard approach was start where people are, which is your community, your neighbors, your people that you work with, the people you meet in the supermarket. And Paul's standard approach became to become all things to all men. And I remember we prayed for this. We had a special prayer and it was very powerful because sometimes we forget this principle or this idea to become all things to all men. So it all depends on who you want to reach. What we do, why, why we do what we do. We need to know why we do it. We need to know why we do some things. We shouldn't just go through the motions. We need to understand what we're doing. So thank God that we have Bible studies like this, you know, where we can learn these principles and get an understanding. And then part eight, principle number 11, reaching the religious. Acts 18, nine through 10. Note that the further we get from the life of Jesus and the day of Pentecost, the more we begin to find people or groups that know something about Jesus without really knowing everything they need to know about him. And that is definitely the case today. With YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, you name it. There are so many methods for people to hear about Jesus and the life of Jesus and the Bible. But are they hearing everything they need to know, right? So it's important that we understand this and how to reach the religious. 
So that brings us to part nine, which is, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, part nine. And this is our main scripture. If somebody would like to read it, this is the main scripture that's been. All right, Matthew 16, chapter, uh, verse 18 to 19. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee... Whoops, sorry about that. The keys of the king... I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ed. These are the keys to the kingdom. Praise God. Amen. So principle number 12, surviving a shipwreck. Has anybody on here survived a shipwreck? If you have, please come forward. <laughs> we want your testimony tonight. And if somebody could read Acts 27, 9 through 15. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for long voyages by then because it was so late in the fall. And Paul spoke to the ship's officers about, about it. Sirs, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, injuries, and danger to our lives. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner then to Paul. And since Fairhavens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go to Phoenix, further up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a, <coughs> a southwest and northwest exposure. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed along close to shore. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength, north, a nor'easter, they called it, caught the ship and blew it out to sea. They couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate it. Um, well, we are all familiar with nor'easters here on Long Island. In fact, that was the thing that dumped all that snow on us uh, a couple of weeks ago. So they encountered this on the water. Now, the Apostle Paul had previously been in three shipwrecks, according to 2 Corinthians 11.25. Would somebody please read that? I'll read it. Um, thrice I was beaten with rods, once was stoned, thrice I, su I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Thank you, Douglas. And the the uh, around the time of Acts 20. So there are not many details uh, whatsoever that are given about these events. Why is such detail given here? Why would Luke, the author of the book of Acts, devote such a long section of Acts to this description of a shipwreck? Well, the principle here is First, the natural, and then the spiritual. There is a spiritual lesson found here. Acts, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 46 says, However, the spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and afterward, the spiritual. So, there was a natural storm first, and then there was a spiritual work through that natural storm. Paul was finally on his way to Rome, although he had never expected to go as a prisoner. They set out from Caesarea and began to sail along the coast of the Mediterranean. However, the voyage became difficult because of strong winds. They transferred to a large grain ship from Egypt, but strong winds again hindered. It took them many days to travel 130 miles. Finally, they struggled into the port known as Fair Haven on the south side of the island of Crete. It is here that the centurion makes his fatal decision 
to continue the journey. So it was the centurion who was leading the ship that made the decision to continue. So the word of God is filled with tragic records of men and women who began well but failed to survive spiritually. The spirit of the Lord came on Samson, and we know that story, but that he squandered most of his life in sensuality. God chose Saul to be Israel's first king, but had to cast him aside when pride ruined him. Solomon prayed for divine wisdom in his youth, but tolerated pagan evils in his old age. At one time, Judas was an apostle. Even Paul said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. Storms you could not dream of may come into your life or your family, or even into the church that you attend. Sooner or later, you will be tested. That's the nature of life's voyage. And you know, I remember when I first came to the Lord, I would hear of all the trials and testings, you know, that different people had gone through. I mean, not that many, but a few. And I remember saying to myself, Lord, please don't put me through any tests. I mean, I was a brand new Christian. What did I know, right? But that was my first thought. Lord, please don't bring me through these testings. Please don't make me go through what these other people have gone through. But you know what? Sometimes through the errors of others, through no fault of our own, we become shipwrecked along life's journey. It's even possible for the church problems to shipwreck you. Unfortunately, that's true. There are things that can happen in church. Why? Why do things happen in the church? Because we're people. And where people are, things are going to happen. People are going to disagree. People are going to uh, strive with each other. People are going to thrive with each other. People are going to get along, not get along. So there's, there could be shipwrecks in the church, right? And those are the things that we learn through the Word of God, where we, you know, we learn about unity. We learn about agreeing together. We learn about um, esteeming others higher than ourselves. So this is where, you know, those shipwrecks in the church are where we learn to be true Christians. Amen. Matthew 24, 10 through 13. Would somebody please read? And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. Thank you, Sister Melissa. The Apostolic Church is built on those children who know how to survive the storms of life, even when they are caused by people who are in the same boat or who ride in the same boat. It's so imperative that we understand, you know, uh, whether we're new Christians or even as we go along and live for God a long time, that at, we, when you live for God a long time, you learn this uh, eventually, that in the church, there are many different people growing at different times. Yeah, like yeah. you might get a victory in your life, but somebody else still hasn't learned that. Yeah. And we can't force that on them. You can't force people to be a certain at a certain level in God. Uh, there's so many different things. Somebody, one person might be, spend a lot of time fasting and praying and studying the word. And another person might be just you know, just praying and doing their, you know, whatever they can to get by and go into church. And they're not going to grow the same way as that person that's, you know, devoting themselves to God like that. So we have to be understanding that uh, we are all at different levels. Praise God. But it's still God's will for us to work together. Amen. So what about the saints who sink the ship? <laughs> Now, you know, I go back here. I did bring in Jonah because remember Jonah, that ship was, you know, being tossed to and fro and, you know, they had to start throwing everything overboard. 
and eventually Jonah got thrown overboard. But the point was, it wasn't their fault that the ship was going through this storm. <clears throat> they were innocently taking Jonah where he wanted to go. So there are times you're going to be in, in through life that you're going to encounter storms, and it wasn't your fault. You're going to be maybe in a car, and, and you know, um, somebody hits the car, you know, that you're in. Somebody else caused that accident, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Um, so what about those saints who sink the ship? Well, I'm just going to quickly read through these. Um, well, actually, there's a lot under each one, even though I didn't put it on this page. They, they cause problems because of the wrong decisions that they make. That's a big one. Fair Haven, remember the, the, the ship was brought into Fair Haven like the, the captain wanted to continue. Um, Fair Haven was not the most comfortable place to spend the winter months. And a fair wind at that time of sailing made it look like they could quite easily get to the port of Phoenix. Paul admonished them to stay. Fair Haven was a safe place, right? It may even sound safe. And Phoenix, you know, was, was a, a ways off. So he said, because sailing was dangerous at this time of year, but they listened to the majority rather than the man of God. How often does that happen? Yeah. We tend to side with the majority. We tend to side with somebody that maybe sounds better than the other person. It, this is a tough thing. You know, we have to be able to be sensitive to the voice of God and the wisdom of God and the reasoning of God. Um, so here Paul was telling them, but they listened to the majority rather than the man of God. No one thinks their storm is going to be bad enough to shipwreck them. Hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't go, right? Yeah. Number two, they stop resisting and end up way off course. If only they could have seen that their 50-mile journey around an island would take them 600 miles off course around the Mediterranean Sea. So just to put that in perspective, it's like starting out from Long Island for the New Jersey shore and winding up in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's exactly what happened. They hope to outrun the storm and eventually get back on course. But the moment they gave up resisting the wind, they lost control. So I'm going to repeat this. The moment they gave up resisting the wind, they lost control. So there's going to be things that are going to come against you. There's going to be things that life is going to throw at you. But if you just give up, throw in the towel, and don't resist what's coming against you in the sense that, you know, like in this storm, Sometimes we want to just give up. We want to say, forget it. We want to say, oh, I'm tired of doing this. Whatever, whatever excuse we could come up with. Very few storms simply blow over to stay on course. Okay? Very few storms are going to just blow over. So the main thing is to stay on course, no matter what you have to do to do that. Sin, especially sins of the Spirit, will take you much farther than you ever intended to go. Number three, they concentrate on surviving instead of progressing. That's an interesting statement. They used ropes and chains to wrap around the ship to keep it together, trying to reinforce the beams and plug the leaks. They pulled in the sails and just concentrated on survival. Entering survival mode may make us feel like we are still accomplishing something, but it only pro prolongs the inevitable. That's something you really have to think about. Praise God. Survival mode. <laughs> Praise God. They, number four, they throw out necessities in a vain effort to make things better. They cast even the tackling of the ship, things they needed. Many people think that as long as they are religious, that they will be saved. But we can't save ourselves from the storms of life. And that's what I had prayed, you know, when I was a brand new Christian. I was afraid. I heard all this testing that everybody went through. But we have to go through the storms of life. That's, what, that's how God created it. 
so that we can learn. Praise God. God doesn't expect you to throw out your personality and just please him. He understands who you are. He knows you. He created you in his image. Through him, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Even the hairs on our, on our heads are numbered. So God knows us, right? And he doesn't want you to demand that of anyone else. So we can't demand anyone else to just please God and not be who they are. And anyone that's on here that, you know, is insecure or lack confidence or you've ever been through that and you had to work your way to get more confident in things. And I think we can all say amen. Amen. <laughs> um, if you do anything in ministry, if you put yourself in any kind of, if you're asked to do anything or you, even if you put yourself in a place where you really shouldn't, um, <clears throat> you shouldn't do that. But if you're asked to do something and, and you, you know, you just get really nervous and scared, like, what if I mess up? What if I say the wrong things? What if I don't say it right? What if I forget what I'm supposed to say? You know, it's a form of a fear, a fear of failure in a sense. But God doesn't want us to fear failure. Amen. He wants us to trust in him. And allow him to be our confidence, to be who you are. So if you are a very, let's just say, and I hope this is nobody on here, but if you have a very dry personality, you know, you talk very slowly, you know, you don't put any emphasis on anything, and you know, somebody asks you to lead in prayer or to, you know, talk about your testimony, you know what? You can't let that stop you from doing the, what, whatever opportunity God puts before you. I remember we had a preacher that came to Bethel on a Thursday night. He was like a matter-of-factly type of guy. He just stood there with his hands in his pocket. He didn't get excited. <laughs> he just, but he was very sincere. And you could pick, pick up his sincerity right away. And he just told the story the way it was. You know, he didn't walk back and forth like some <laughs> preachers, you know. And and there's nothing wrong with any of that. It's just he was very sincere, very quiet, but it was a powerful message. So what I'm trying to say is be yourself in God. Let God use you with your personality because God made you a particular way. So you don't have to ch throw out your personality to please God. And he doesn't want us to demand that of other people. We have to let people be who they are. Yeah. Praise God. Because he wants all of us. Christianity is more than just getting, gritting your teeth in a joyless existence. No. He Amen. wants us to be who we are through him. Number five, they lose their hope and simply fall apart. And I put that up there so you could read through this one. Once people lose their hope, and the definition of that is to desire with expectation of fulfillment, they just end up going through the motions of religion. They no longer really believe that God will do it. But it was in the midst of failure that Paul stood with a message of hope. He said, sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete. You know, and let me just stop there. That's almost like a shoulda, woulda, coulda. <laughs> That's for Brother Ed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and to uh, you should not, oh, sorry. Sirs, you should have arkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. You know, sort of like I told you so, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're always taught, don't say I told you so. <laughs> But that's exactly what the Apostle Paul was doing. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. All right. So your, your ship is in a storm. It's blowing around like crazy. And he's, you know, they didn't listen, you know, that. But he's telling them, be of good cheer. So when somebody, when you're going through a hard time and somebody's saying, you know, be of good cheer, cheer up, don't get mad at them. <laughs> but there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve. So, you know, he stood there and he said it with authority, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing we need. Don't get offended at the preacher who tells you that you made a wrong decision 
or that you are way off course. The only reason you are offended is that you know he is speaking the truth. Truth hurts, praise God. And I can say that, you know, at my age and most of us at our age, you know, we found out yes. truth hurts, but it's better to be truthful than to lie because people feel, um, what's the word? When you lie to them, they feel, I forget what the word is. Betrayed. Betrayed. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so it's even as much as the truth hurts, it's better to be truthful. It's better to be known as a truthful person. So the storm wasn't over, but for Paul, the storm was as good as over because he had heard from God. There might still be damage to the ship, but his life was saved. Praise God. Don't get offended. Oh, I, I, went, I went to the wrong place. Sorry. So this is not the typical happy ending story. In fact, the worst is yet to come. That's why many people never survive the storm. They expect, they expect the sun to shine immediately. I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Praise God. So they expect the sun to shine immediately, but instead the waves sweep higher and the winds intensify. If you've ever been on a boat, um, when the winds pick up and the waves get really high, it's pretty scary. Yeah. I can't imagine being in a ship like any of these. And sailors do in, you know, experience that type of thing. But this is what life is like, right? Sometimes the waves are going to come up over you. Sometimes you're going to feel like you're sinking. And there's no way out. But when the ship hits the rocks, Paul had to jump in the cold, stormy waters and swim for his life. But he still had hold of God's promise. While the sailors mocked, the sails ripped off and the boat fell apart around him. Did you ever feel like things are coming apart at the seam? Mm-hmm. Paul placed the deck, paced the deck and encouraged the crew. And he said, I believe God. You know, when you're going through that test and your faith is being tested and your trust in God is being tested and you start to complain even and you start to wonder, is this really worth it? But if you stand there and with all that's in you, you say, I believe God. God. Amen. That's what Paul did. He said he even believed God while swimming for his life. Praise God. Amen. We've many of us have been through those kind of spiritual battles. We're swimming for our lives. We're swimming through the word of God trying to find an answer. We're swimming through all the things, swimming through our minds, you know, like we go to, we lay our heads down on the pillow and all these things are swimming through our minds. We're swimming for our life. Lord, we need an answer. We've all been in that place, but we need to have that in our spirit. I believe God. Paul said, oh, hold on a second. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Amen. It didn't matter what happened to him once he heard from God. God took the sting out of the storm. God took the steam sting out of the storm. When we hear from God, we may still go through rough waters, but the promise of God is still true. Don't let others shipwreck your dream, but rather stand there and say, I believe God. Amen. I'm going to hold on to my dreams. Or, or better yet, surrender your dreams to God. But yeah. don't let others shipwreck your dreams. Amen. Praise God. If you have a dream, like I remember talking to, uh, of course, you know, we're family. So we talked about some of these things. But I remember uh, Brother Alex and Sister Melissa. They wanted to leave Long Island. <laughs> quite a few times and they're not the only ones you know there's many, many people have already left 
Yeah. But thank God they stayed. Because I remember when they said to us, you know, they were trying and everything kept falling through. And I was like, I'm sorry, but I was praying for you. <laughs> 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 and, and you know, I, I, you know, we pray, Lord, not my will, but thine will be done. Because we yeah. don't want to control people's lives. But we do pray for those things, you know, from time to time. And I prayed for them and I, I was like, Lord... They always said that they felt a calling to ministry. They felt a calling that they had a burden for Long Island. So it was very obvious it was the enemy that was, and he's done it to many people because it's such yeah. a, a, it's not an easy area to minister in. So I thank God that they heard from God, that they knew, well, even though God made it a little hard for them, like kind of shipwrecked their plans, um, that they, they turned around and they said, we're going to stay and we're going to do a work for God. And we're going to, we want to reach Long Island. We want to reach Suffolk County. We want to reach souls. Praise God. Well, when you say you want to reach Suffolk County, that's what you mean. You want to help the people there come to God. And so I thank God that the enemy wasn't able to shipwreck their dream to be used of God on Long Island. Because truly there is such a work here on Long Island in Suffolk County. Amen. So principle number 13. Witnessing through weakness. How many of you have weaknesses? I can't see your hands, but I'm sure <laughs> we all have our hands up in the air. <laughs> yeah. um, Acts 28.20, 20. would somebody please read that? I'll read Acts 28.20. 20. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel... I am bound with this chain. Amen. Thank you, Sister Alma. And Colossians 4.18. Should I read that too? Sure. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. That was written from Rome to the Colossians by Tychius and Onimus, Onis, Onisimus. I'm just going to make a statement up front. I am terrible at pronouncing names. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, so Rome was the greatest city Paul had ever seen, with more than a million citizens and about a million slaves living on its seven hills. He was placed again under house arrest, constantly chained to a soldier but able to receive friends, write letters, and even preach. Once again, he shared the truth about Jesus with the Jews first. But when most of them refused him, he turned to the Gentiles. For two years, he had to pay for his lodging, even though he was confined and waiting for his trial. Luke's book of Acts ends here since it was written as evidence for his upcoming trial before Caesar. Now, you might think that Paul's constant imprisonment was depressing. I, I certainly would think that most prisoners at some point get depressed being bound in a, in a jail somewhere. It certainly could have been. To the human spirit, there's nothing worse than chains. And yet, when we get right down to it, every one of us has chains of some kind. Amen? Amen. I know when uh, when I got came to God, my first, I'm just going to say my first year in the Lord, I spent a lot of time just praying and pounding on the floor. I would get in prayer and I would just be pounding and pounding because there were all those things in me that had to go, those, those, uh, those chains that were still on me from from uh, one chain that I had um, was smoking cigarettes. And uh, I'm going to say right now, I've learned it's an emotional chain as well. It's not mm -hmm. just a physical addiction, but it's an emotional addiction. And I had that because stupidly, <laughs> when I was 16 years old and both my parents smoked, so it was natural, it's very natural lots of times when both your parents smoked that the children, when they become teenagers, at some point, take up smoking. And at that time, you know, in the 70s, 
you know, my friends were all smoking and it was cool to smoke, right? And so I took up smoking to fit in. That's basically the bottom line. But that's an emotional thing. And so at that point, I allowed a root into my life. And I held on. And of course, I got addicted and I kept smoking until I was 20, when I came to the Lord when I was 29. But the thing was, is even though I stopped smoking, I still hadn't been delivered from that emotional root of dependency. And I, I just really feel to share this. I feel this is for somebody. So I apologize for taking up a little extra time. That's but fine. we went to a prayer meeting and everybody, you know, was kneeling around. It was in somebody's house and we were all just kneeling around. It was an old fashioned prayer meeting. And that's what we used to do. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, Alex might remember this. I know my husband remembers this because he would have some of the prayer meetings at his house. We would go from in Suffolk County. We were going from house to house. We had a schedule and we would just rotate homes and go and pray at different people's homes. And this particular time we were at a home in Patchog because quite a few people lived in Patchog at the time. And we were, we were done praying. We were leaving the house and one of the ladies said, I feel deliverance. And we all just looked at her and well, that was the call to come back. <laughs> so we all turned around and went back in and began to pray again in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God moved on me. And I'm not kidding. I just started spitting up. I started spitting up. I start, it, it was just coming out of me. Not disgustingly gross, but enough, you know. And when I was done, I knew that God had delivered me. From Praise smoking. God. It Praise was that God. emotional dependency that had been there from when I was 16. God had broken it in me. I don't, you know, nothing can tempt me as far as cigarettes go. So there, it was an emotional dependency. So praise God. We all have weaknesses. We all have chains that have to be broken in Jesus' name. Amen. We just have to get in prayer and, and be sensitive to God as he leads you and be willing to, to, to let things go. Be willing to surrender those things to God. Amen. So, um, hold on a second now that I got carried away with my testimony. I lost my place. So, in his first epistle, Paul introduced himself as Paul, an apostle. Not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. After more suffering, he felt he was less than the least of all saints, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of God. After two years in chains in Rome, he finally realized that Christ Jesus came into the world to, uh, to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, it is a common misconception that chains prevent growth and effective work, that the slightest difficulty in circumstances or drops in privileges is reason enough to simply quit. We cannot quit. We must press on. Praise God. Amen. Paul proved from his experience that it's simply not true. For while he was imprisoned in Rome, he produced some of the best epistles. <clears throat> he preached and prayed, witnessed and worshipped while chained to an unbelieving Roman guard. Talk about opposition. Amen. He yeah. said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And we already read that Philippians 4.11. I wonder which of Paul's guards inspired his writing, which began, put on the whole armor of God, <laughs> that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. 
Ephesians 6, 11. Or which one first heard the scripture? Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Which one of his guards, right? All of his guards were affected, and many of them became believers, even though the one who witnessed to them was in chains. So chains are not a hindrance. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Paul described himself in one place as an ambassador in bonds, Ephesians 6.20. But that description could apply to most of God's servants. We all have chains of some kind, whether they be bonds of physical affliction, amen, shackles of circumstance. You know, think of a single mom, okay, who's raising her children doesn't have much financial support, has to be considerate of her children's, uh, you know, care when they come out of school, has to be able or to have a job where she can either work from home. You know, it's a shackle in a way. You know, the, the single mom doesn't have the freedom to do as she pleases. Um, or the letters of a fiery trial. The question is, Will we still continue to work for God even when we don't understand the chains? I can imagine there are some people today, you know, we've just gone through a horrible two years, you know, with a terrible virus. I'm not even going to say its name. <laughs> Amen. But just think, you know, of the chains that people are in right now, the chains of fear the chains of not being able to move forward, the chains of not being able to change, like their life suddenly did change, but now they don't know how to change back because now they're stuck in that in that movement. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so there are chains. So the question is, will we continue to work for God even if we don't understand the chains? The most important thing we have to be is that ambassador for yeah. Jesus Christ. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He brought us into this kingdom for a purpose. So we cannot let the chains of this life, whatever they are, maybe it's a mask, maybe it's, you know, there are pe people on this prayer group that are in Bible study that had to make decisions, you know, about their jobs because of the vaccines, you know. Those that are raising families, well, you know, what if I don't want the vaccine? Then I might lose my job or... You know, and it went on and on. There were so many. And that was a question that they had to ask themselves because you honestly have to wonder, why do I have to even think about this? Yeah. You know, why do I have to be worried about my, losing my job? You know, uh, I'm just trying to serve God. You know, I just want to do what's mm. right. But yet these are the chains that we have or the shipwrecks in life, if you will. Paul said, Paul described himself as one. We all have those chains. He said, remember my chains. Paul won Onesimus to the Lord while he was bound in Philemon 10. His brethren developed boldness because of his prison term, waxing confident by my bonds. That's what he said. He said, and because of my chains in Philippians 1.14, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear because of his chains. Yeah. Praise God. Wow. The Apostle Paul, what an example, right? Amen. Praise God. He said, remember my chains, remember my chains. This happened because Paul remembered that even while he was bound, the word of God is not bound the word of god is not chained the word of god is not bound 2 timothy 2 9 can somebody read that please is anybody still there 
Second um, Timothy 2 9, wherein I suffered trouble. as an evil I hope you I only heard it as an evil you didn't uh, well, finish should, the sentence should I read okay uh, wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer even unto bonds but the word of God is not bound amen amen, amen. thank you sister Gina you're welcome. The word of God is not bound. Simon Peter and Paul were on trial by the Emperor Nero along with many other Christians who were blamed for the great fire of Rome in AD 64. After the trial, they were confined to prison together until finally being executed on the same day. Wow. Peter was nailed to a cross as a public spectacle at Nero's circus. They took this as, and made it a spectacle, right? Mm. It was a game to them. Unbelievable. Their head downward and at his own request said he did not feel worthy to die like his Lord. And as a Roman citizen, Paul was beheaded in a less public place. So because of his citizenship, they honored his request, you know, to be... Um, executed privately or a less public place he said remember my chains remember my chains perhaps all Paul could think about as he was being led to his execution was a single scripture he had written much earlier for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that we will be revealed in us. Because sometimes, I know I do, we forget this is all about glory. This is all about going to be in glory. This is not about, you know, yes, we have to live this life here. We have to work through the shipwrecks, right? We have to live through the shipwrecks. We've got to work our way back to land to be safe, right, through the storm. But we have to remember this is not about what's happening here. It's about the eternal glory that we will have to be with our Lord and Savior. And so sometimes we, for, we forget. But Paul wrote to us and said, remember my chains. Yes. He said, remember my chains. There was a reason I went through those chains. Remember what I went through. And remember that it is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Praise God. He said, remember my chains. Will you work for God in spite of your chains? Paul did. Let's determine to witness through our weakness. Because that's what the church of God is all about. He is building his church. We are his people. We are his ambassadors. We are his children, his, his royal priesthood. Right? We, we have to and we must know our identity, which is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so tonight, as we end this Bible study, and I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Brother Alex, we want to remember the chains that Paul went through. We want to remember, uh, and we want to remember not to compare ourselves one to another. What somebody else's storm might look like compared to my storm, we can't compare them. Praise God. We just need each other to get through them. We need each other to get through the shipwrecks. Praise God. Somebody that's been through a few shipwrecks before you might tell you how to get through the storm, how you know what to do. Maybe they might tell you, just wait, just wait. Don't go forward yet, you know, or something like that. Wait on the Lord. Be still, you know, listen to his still small voice. Whatever instruction God gives you that it, it we're all in this together. Amen. Yes. Amen. And so we got to determine to witness through our weakness in Jesus name. So brother Alex, you know, I hand this back to you. In Jesus all, right. Name. all right. Thank you so much, sister Patty, for such a timely, encouraging uh, lesson um, today. Um, I really feel the Holy Ghost. I feel like 
God is definitely speaking to all of us. And I just want to ask us to pray together one, just together, uh, you know, if you're going through something, if you're dealing with issues in your life that uh, you, seem to be shipwrecking you, um, I want us to just go to the Lord and just ask him to encourage us and, and, and just allow him to, um, to help us as we, uh, we don't, we, we, we persevere to attain whatever it is that he has for us and not let go, not give up, not, not turn away from the purpose that he has for us because our situation seems, uh, so dire and so, um, overwhelming. But let us pray that God gives us his strength and that, and let us determine that we will um, stay strong and hold on to the truth in spite of our storm. Precious Lord, Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your gentle reminder tonight, Lord, that there is nothing that can shipwreck us as long as we are holding on to you, as long as we are being guided by your loving hand, Lord Jesus I know, Lord, that the storm is terrible. It is frightening. And it it seems as if it's going to destroy all that we have uh, built up in our lives and all that we have been uh, looking forward to in our lives, Lord God. But Lord, uh, help us to recognize, Lord, that when we hang on to you and we hold on to your unchanging love and unchanging arm Lord God that you will anchor us in your love anchor us in peace anchor us in joy Lord God even in the midst of the storm and I pray for those of us who are going through storms I pray that you would comfort us Lord God give us peace rest, and sanctuary in the palm of your hand Lord God as the winds blow as the thunder flashes and the, and the lightning flashes and the thunder rages Lord God in Jesus' name, Lord God. Bless us, Lord God. Strengthen us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let this be as a catalyst, Lord, for our uh, new direction in our lives, Lord God, that you want to take us. In Jesus' name. Jesus, thank you, Lord. God. Praise your name, Jesus. Be with us as we go our separate ways tonight, Lord God. Bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Bring us back together. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Um, All right. Well, praise Brother the Lord. Alex? Yes, Sister Patty. Um, do we have time to open it up in case someone wants um, focus prayer for something in their life? I'm for. I'm sorry. You it um, broke oh. up there. I... Yes. It can do we have time to maybe open it up for focus prayer for somebody if they really feel that the the lesson spoke to something and they want to pray? Sure, absolutely. I'm opening up the the meeting to anybody who wants to just share with us what a little bit of what they're going through and would like to receive prayer. We are a family. We we love one another. It's it's okay to confess our our needs one to another, our faults or whatever is going on in our lives. I think somebody just wrote something in the chat. Uh oh, Sister Melissa was apologizing oh. <laughs> for Daniel. <laughs> That's all right, um, Sister I Melissa. I didn't hear the whole lesson, but uh, I mean, I'll take prayer for um, just for clarity, you know, and uh, what to do next. All right. Amen. Amen. I'll leave it like that. <laughs> all right. 
Well, let's pray for Sister Nicole. God would give her wisdom and direction. In Jesus' name, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and are doing in the life of Nicole. Lord God, you promised that the good work that you've begun in her, you would be faithful to complete it, Lord God. We pray, God, that you would give her clarity and give her uh, the ability to trust in you even when the storm is rising and building around her, Lord God. I pray, Lord, that she would be strengthened in her Lord faith God. and her trust Hallelujah, in you, Lord God, Jesus, every Jesus, step of this Lord God, journey, Lord every God, step the winds of, uh, opposition, allow her, Lord, to hold on Help to us, your oh unchanging God, to hand up, but to keep pushing as you lead and guide her, even though the way seems dark, foreboding, <laughs> and unpleasant, Lord God, I pray that you would you, give her the confidence and the trust, Lord, to hold on to you, to continue to trust in you, to continue to be at peace. God, whatever, the Lord God, that they are maybe that you are with her, your rod and your staff, they come that you would touch it, Lord God, that you would do a mighty work, Lord God, that your will be done, Father, in Jesus' name. Oh, God, that we can all have the vision, that we can all have the place that we need, Lord God. Hallelujah, that we can all find, oh, God, our way through the storms, oh, God. Jesus' name. Praise her name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.